we are, but just off the English coast. Um, a good night, um, kind of just kept to myself and uh, slowly made sail. Uh, here we go with the, that's the third reef in, and then the jib set ahead of it. That's extremely conservative. We only had about 15, maybe 20 knots last night, but ex you know, that's exactly where we want to be at, hugely conservative. That's all we've got in our mind now is uh, be safe and get this boat across. Um, just because it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck doesn't mean it is a duck. It looks like an over 60 and it's sailing, but it is in no way operational in the way that it should be or can be. So we just gotta keep that in mind. So to that end, I am now approaching Falmouth. The weather system that we are looking at, um, it keeps changing as these things do. The, uh, the model keeps uh, altering. Basically what it comes down to is it may be this, it may be that, but definitely by uh, nine o'clock tomorrow morning, it's passed through. Um, at the moment, it could be going upwind in 25 knots, going upwind in 35 knots, uh, fine reaching in 35 knots. It doesn't matter, we're not at that point. We've got to be really, really mindful of where we're at, which is that we have a boat which has not sailed properly in 12 years. It's done one 30 mile motoring trip in 12 years. So everything's worked very, very, very well. Um, all the electronics are great, the charging has been great, the uh, alternator is kicking in with 60 or 70 amps which is more than I ever see on Challenger. Um, so, so far so good with Falcon, she's doing really really well. Um, well look, a couple of fishing boys here, gotta be careful. So this is cool, we're approaching, um, you know we come in here at the end of our Marconi trip every year, we do this uh, race over from Newfoundland to the UK which we We've done it in eight days in 23 hours, eight days in 22 hours. Um, we didn't do it this year because uh, Challenger had a problem with their keel. So I was thinking, well, I wasn't going to be able to come here, but here I am. So that's kind of cool. So Falmouth also is a super famous place for solo sailors. This is where Sir Robin Knox Johnston, or just at that point, Robin Knox Johnston, first set foot back on land after his um, historic solo non-stop round the world trip in 1969 and an interesting bit of trivia is that the stone which they placed on the jetty here at the Falmouth uh, Yacht Club um, it was only years later that they realized that they'd spelled his name John Sun instead of John Stun on the stone so they had to change it but um, we're gonna go in now to where we normally sit which is at Challenger Key um, they're just confirming others they've got enough depth Okay, so I'm going to make my little turn here. I've got to go in here. Oh, make my turn now, look. The bu -bu driving her without an autopilot so I've been driving her solo with an autopilot I've done 6,000 miles in the last two and a half years um, doing deliveries home and all the rest of the stuff but it has been extraordinarily um, uh, insightful and, and a great opportunity to learn because with these boats you know if you're out sailing around uh, doing a race or far offshore your greatest concern is that something's gonna go wrong and you're gonna be left without power. Um, I've had that concern myself when I was off the, um, I was about a thousand miles south of Perth going underneath Australia in that round the world race. And I ended up in a situation where I had very, very little power and the engine didn't want to start. Right, here we go, here's this mark now. So you've got the red and we've got the giant concrete thing. So I'm gonna try and slip between those two. I may even turn up into wind now and drop the main because uh, we're not the most maneuverable thing on the planet and uh, it's just it's just me. <laughs> I find it tricky to uh, organize where this camera's going. I'm not really up to speed with this. I don't want to drop my phone in the drink. Can you see what's going on? You kind of propped inside the sail bag. No, I do. Okay, so the request from pretty much everybody in the comments has been that I go through as much of the single-handed stuff as I can. So I guess this is 
as good a chance as any because basically it's just loads of wind noise otherwise. So you can see here the boat's starting to make a turn up to windward. I've used the autopilot to come up probably 20 or 30 degrees. The sails are set for reaching, the main sail there quite loose on the uh, main sheet. The jib probably at this point is a little bit too loose so what I'm probably going across to the starboard side to do is to grind in on the jib sheet and that means that the jib will start to throw more wind into the back of the sail. Like a lot of times I talk to people and they talk about reefing or putting sails up and down by going uh, head to wind but then the boom starts flying around and everything gets really dangerous and sails are slatting and lines are flying around. It's not the way to do it. The way to do it is with the head sail pulling either beating or uh, on a fine reach. Uh, the main sail sheet somewhat eased and then that means that the the front edge of the main, the luff, is back winded. There's no pressure on the sliders and it's pretty easy then to start lowering the halyard down. So on Falcon the halyard is a 3 to 1 so a lot of line having to go through my hands here. Um, and we've only got I think the third reef in at this point so there really isn't very much weight in anything. Um, with these boats with the 3 to 1, 2 to 1 type halyards you, you, you just need to let gravity really take over at the top of the sail. Here I'm pulling in the reef lines to secure in the, the back of the sail and they need grinding in. That's going to hold uh, all parts of the sail that are already on the boom on the boom and the rest of it will just hold in the lazy jacks. And here's the berth that I shoehorned the boat into in Falmouth. Uh, 65 foot long, a uh, few nervous uh, calls as I went in but it worked just fine. Well, good morning and welcome back. Uh, welcome to the main event. <clears throat> we are now beating out through the western approaches of the English Channel and uh, <coughs> so far so good. Had a little bit of a, a long morning. Um, went into Falmouth last night and uh, took a little bit of time to rest and, uh, and dodged the worst of this, uh, this wind that's ahead of us, or was ahead of us rather. Um, came out this morning and the autopilot wouldn't work. I left the dock at 2.30 in the morning and uh, I could get the autopilot to steer using the rudder, i.e. it goes one degree port or one degree starboard or two degrees port, two degrees starboard, but it would not drive a compass course or apparent wind or anything else. And um, basically made my way out from Falmouth directly south until I was in clear water. And then uh, for two hours before dawn, just napped in the cockpit and kept watch, you know, the, the English Channel's got a lot of shipping, but they're very much exactly in these very particular shipping lanes. So to the sides of that, there's area, and I probably only moved about a mile and a half um, during the period that I was um, I was sleeping. So I was sleeping in 20 minute shifts. So uh, during that period, I guess uh, the old brain clicking away, trying to work out why the autopilot wasn't working. Obviously, so many things are still new for me. I was a lot of, uh, playing around and messing around with settings and flicking switches and doing things and um, I changed out one of the uh, autopilot computers. I think I've got the old one here. Here's it. <laughs> actually beating. Things are actually moving around. Okay. So this is one of the NKE um, calculators. The white square unit lower down on the dash there does a lot of the thinking. There's three of those on board. And then the at the back of the boat there's uh, two calculators, one for port and one for starboard systems. Um, I changed that out thinking perhaps that was the problem. No bueno, that wasn't the issue at all. Although I changed out one I know doesn't work. Um, so um, Basically, you can have the autopilot on using the port system or using the starboard system. There's two entire systems here. It's so that you can set it up for, one is set up for going upwind, one's set up for going downwind, and also, of course, your redundancy. So, um, I knew that one of the computers wasn't working, that's why I brought the spare. I swapped that in to see if that was uh, uh, some kind of solution, it wasn't. So this went on and on. The time now is what, eight, so I guess there's like an hour and a half, two hours of this and me just drifting around basically uh, a couple of miles south of Falmouth. Um, and finally it worked out what it was and that was that the one of my button flicking sessions, I feel like Dougal from Father Ted, um, I had flicked on the log. So you see... 
Okay, so this is how it goes. Right in the middle of whatever you're doing, the boat calls and you've got to go. There was a bit of a, a bang and a crash on deck. Uh, I went up, there was nothing particularly wrong with um, the boat, but the, the seas were starting to get a little bit heavier and the very square-backed waves coming down the channel. It was wind against tide and I made a decision in the name of um, conservation of the boat and, uh, and getting to know the boat uh, in her somewhat uh, depleted state here that I would just change down from the jib to the staysail. So this is footage uh, obviously of me doing that. You see that the clue of the staysail is thrown over the side of the boat. Um, the clue can get caught up in the guard wires uh, really quite easily. Um, I guess it's a bit of a hangover from uh, working with crews, but you want that clue totally out of the way. Here I'm releasing the tack strop that's holding down the sail. Um, jibs are aerodynamically lifting sails, so if they're not tethered down, they will attempt to climb up the rig. So you very quickly learn to keep them tethered. Because it's a bit of a slapdash system that I put together in um, Sherborg, it's got a carabiner, but normally that'd be a, um, a snap shackle attached to the halyard. And you could actually take the sail off if you wanted, keeping the halyard in place. This is great though, I love this. I love being on the front of these boats when they're plowing along. And even though we're in this um, slow down, limp kind of mode, she's still very, very capable of, um, of picking up to 12, 13, 14 knots. Yeah, this is, this is the best place in the world to stand when one of these things is flying along. And, here we go. Oh, okay, there's a bit of a wave coming here, is it? Oh, is she going to get onto it? Oh, not this time. Maybe there's another one coming along behind. You know, the thing about this is you do this as a job and as you work, but there is still pleasure in it. And uh, when all that lot is full of sail and she's lifted and pressed by hundreds of horsepower, of sail area pushing her along, and she gets that incredible burst of energy and goes surfing off down a wave, there really is nothing like it. Oh, look, here we go. Is this a wave coming? Yeah, I'm excited just watching this. <laughs> okay, here we go. See, I'm not sure she's got enough to pick up and go properly. Let's have a look. Come on, Chris, look forwards. Yeah, okay, you see there's no wave at the front at all. The front third of the boat is out of the water at this point. So she's only got the jib up, so I'm sure she's only doing 13 or 14 knots. But um, hopefully later we'll be able to get a bit of footage together and, uh, and show you what, uh, what she's really capable of. And remember, on the polars for this boat, she can flatline in flat water at 21 knots. So surfs being up to 40% uh, more than uh, average speed, you know, that you're looking at 30 knots. And indeed the fastest I've ever done on, um, on one of these boats, the sister ship of this boat, um, is 33 knots. So whatever it was that was on deck is now sorted out. So back to the cockpit, what am I doing here? Just clipping my, oh yeah, that's the other point, right? So I may not wear a life jacket when I do this stuff because as a solo sailor, who's coming back for you? No one, but I have this belt, this deck assist belt, which I built. Um, and I am always clipped on to the boat as much, as much, as much as I possibly can be. You know, these days, you've got to think about things a little bit differently. Does it really matter if you're um, not au natural? If you're au natural in a car without a seatbelt on, do you feel better or feel worse? Like personally, mm, I'm kind of down with the whole seatbelt in cars thing. I just can't afford the risk. And it's the same on the boat. Just uh, having that belt on makes a big difference. What are we up to now? Oh, okay, so, I'm, oh wow, I've actually got all the footage here of, of hoisting the sail. So this is the halyard for the staysail. It's a two-to-one halyard, um, and that's a uh, three-speed winch. So the ratios of these halyards to the winches, to the arm length on the, on the handbike in here, it all works together to create something which is very usable and useful. It's kind of like the gears on your bicycle. Um, you want your legs going around at a constant, easy pace. Um, without too much torque being transferred through. You don't want to be sweating and having a, a, a huge problem trying to, um, trying to control this, uh, this sail as it goes up. What you want is just to be moving rope in a very natural, easy manner and the sail's going up. Um, looks like I just put the sheet on there so that the, uh, the clue of the sail was... Oh, I've cut some out there. Yeah, I've cut some out there. Look at how much rope is through. So I imagine there's probably about three or four minutes. I look like I'm reversing the grind now, which means I'm tensioning the top of the sail. So just down there, now the staysail will be all over the, um, the, the jib. That means the jib's having a bit of a problem flying. There you go, just bringing in the, the sheet. The winches on this boat are connected, uh, the primary winches in the, in the waist, in the middle of the cockpit, are connected to the grinder. The ones at the back aren't. That's something I wouldn't mind changing, actually. But having said that, you know, I really love top-loaded winches. I went around the world solo once before with um, only top-loaded winches, and I really have no problem with them. I, I've found it to be a very efficient way of uh, putting energy into a winch. But the style now is obviously for the grinder bike or the coffee grinder, whatever you want to call it. And um, 
I guess people certainly expect them to be on uh, when she's just changing speed here to go from 2.3 to 2.1, i.e. From the, from the utility speed to the high speed and then from the utility speed to the, the lowest, most uh, torque laden speed that's available. Look like I've done whatever I wanted to do there. This is cool, this is like, uh, I have dreams that look like this. Okay, all right, we're back. Where was I? Okay, uh, yeah, just a funny noise on deck there. I've gotta be very cautious at the moment because obviously these are very early days, early hours of uh, getting used to this boat. Um, and we know we've got some tired, tired parts. I've got uh, both back stays on, so let's have a quick look on deck here. See, we've got both both back stays on. That means that the rig is uh, supported twice. say the uh, compared to the last um, the last one of these I had this is uh, it's inspiring the, the the depth of the cockpit you see it's um when you're sitting on the side decks your feet don't really touch the bottom and I see actually there's an addition that's been put in here to raise that up slightly obviously to get it at somebody's uh, correct height for winching I may remove that because I find them a little bit low and I want maximum height. I'm also thinking about putting a, a rail, well maybe extend the spray hood, but uh, also put a rail um, around outside the winches so that there's an extra <coughs> extra kind of grab hold of uh, type uh, something or other in there. Um, where we're intending to go with this boat west around the world, you want every possible grab handle you can have, right? So, um, so yeah, all good. Uh, last night um, in Falmouth, the, the wind and the weather were pretty hideous, and the the windows. Um, we've got three windows down this side, two up top, and then another three on this side. And the corking, the corking on the windows uh, showed why poor old Sylvan, who's been looking after the boat, thank you, Sylvan, has been bailing it out furiously for uh, however long it was in. Um, Cherbourg, uh, it just was running in almost in sheets the water and then when I did cut the corking away I discovered that the windows weren't really attached to the side of the boat, <laughs> a layer of moss between the uh, the laxan of the window and the side of the boat so re-secured that, re-corked them on um, three of them, I got three to do, three that were pretty good uh, but the inside of the boat's already drier and nicer which is good. Um, internally she's fine, we had that problem with the autopilot um, every time I go over a bounce, I'm thinking about the interior and whether we can do what they've got on uh, Adrienne, the boat that set this record, where they have a, a completely canting interior. So the whole interior is built on a swivel and then you can shift it to one side or the other. Because the inside of the boat is basically circular, I think you could work that out. And I, um, so yeah, so I feel a little bit kind of like on tenterhooks because um, well, you know, it's big enough weather. We're also going up against the tide of the English Channel. The tide's coming in now because of that delay this morning with the um, the autopilot and it not working. That delayed me three hours, so I'm now against the tide. But we're still making still making seven knots upwind. We're we're only sailing about. Don't <laughs> just ignore this uh, dial in the centre. Where's my finger? There we go. That dial there is the uh, interior. Um, wind angle. There's one up on top here going on. This one's seized but I realize like it, it moves around with the it moves around with the boat so maybe it could be like a kind of an inclinometer maybe it's a trans instrumental instrument. It wants to be a it wants to be an inclinometer so maybe we'll help it with that maybe it could be fun. Um, Got my little lights sorted inside here. This one was working, the other one on this side wasn't. So I went through, took it off, fixed the switch, replaced the bulbs, tied all the contacts, we stuck it back up. 
recorked and in position. Took a bit of time actually with the vacuum cleaner and just went over the roof to remove the paint. You know, I could put a coat of paint on this, but what's obviously happening is you've got enamel paint underneath, or rather epoxy paint underneath, and then you've got single pack paint uh, on top of that, which probably looked great the day it was done, but now 10, 12 years later, it's all uh, coming apart. And that was probably from me either hitting it with the bleach when I was last on the boat and tidying up, or just the humidity and the heat inside the boat has finally pulled it off. So let's have a quick look. So we have to do is every 10 to 15 minutes, Okay, I'll just help myself out here a little bit. Uh, I didn't have a windsock, so most of this was shot on the iPhone, but uh, yeah, every 10 to 15 minutes, just come up and have a look on deck and have a look for shipping, have a look for things in the water, check everything on deck, make sure the sail trim's right, look up the rig. This is the basis by which we keep the boat safe as a solo sailor, regular 20 minute checks. Start with my logbook as well, which I'll, I'll get into shortly. I'm, uh, big believer in, uh, in log books. It's uh, amazing how they help a tired mind keep on top of what's important. Oh. Well, I've got to say there's a couple of things which uh, this boat interior wise is very similar to um, my last Open 60, but loving some aspects like I had nowhere to sit and lean on this board when I was on the last boat. There was the, it was like this, but then this one had been removed for some reason. Like, if it was to save weight, I tell you, it was it was a wasted effort because these things probably don't even weigh. They probably don't weigh five pounds. It's, it's all Nomex core and then carbon sheath on top, right? So, um, but there was nowhere to lean. Now I've got like got a little cushion I can slide across, and got a little cushion here. The problem is, I like I want to just enjoy it. Oh, I can see some water dripping from that window. Oh, oh yeah, look, I think you see like that little bag over there. It's got water in it, it's coming out of that window. At least the other two windows are corked so they're completely dry. Oh, well there we go, got a little job. Uh, so the main thing for me now is I'm gonna get some food because I have been living pretty much on Haribo, which anybody who knows me will not be surprised. However, I gotta say I was surprised and I was able to purchase this <laughs> that Trago Mills and this. <laughs> so And we're on our way to Brest to the corner of France here. By the time we get uh, to the latitude of Brest. The wind will have um, the wind will have uh, passed by. Basically, the system is going northeast. As you might, oh. man, alive! Some big waves because we're going against the tide, right? Some big waves out here. I gotta say, I'm not worried about the hull or the motion. I'm very used to that from all the boats I try. But just every time we go over anything, I keep fearing for the rig. But double back stays, triple four stays, and spin the halyards out where the cap shrouds are. All the lashings checked, all the lashings up the rig replaced. I don't think it's coming down. And I've only got a stay a stay a stay sail up, not even got a main sail up. Alright, I'm gonna have some breakfast because I'm absolutely Hank Marvin and um, we'll come back to this later on. Gotta get into a nice rhythm now, gotta get out the channel. I'm about halfway across to Brest. I've been sailing, I don't know, three hours or something. Um, boat's going very well. So I'm just going to look after myself, leave, leave the jobs for now, and then uh, I can uh, stay, uh, stay alert and stay healthy and stay happy until the end of this bad weather, which is due to be another 12 hours. I think once I've, we have survived the first uh, little blow, <clears throat> that then gives you a foundation of, uh, of trust that you can start to build on. Um, that the thing's not gonna come apart. But uh, for now, I think a little um, plate of bacon and some bread, and I think there's even some mustard in here or something. That'll sort me right out. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, only, oh, still two and a half thousand miles to go, which is exactly where it was when I set off. Hmm. <laughs>